Hello, everyone. Uh, sorry for the technical difficulties. Uh, so we can start the webinar now. My name is uh, Kasun Darmadas, and I'm currently working as a senior software engineer at WS2 Open Banking team. So with this webinar, we'll try to discuss about the open banking security with uh, PSD2 EIDAS certificates. So let me take you through the agenda for today's webinar. So we'll first talk about the introduction to WS2 Open Banking solution, and then move on to the contents of an uh, X509 certificates because the X509 certificates are the base for the PSD2 EIDAS certificates. And then we'll move on to the PSD2 EIDAS certificates and its ecosystem. Then we can talk about uh, registration, certificate issuance, and uh, we can, then we can talk about certificate revocation of EIDA certificates. And uh, after that knowledge, we will uh, go to the types of EIDA certificates and the OBI directory support for EIDAS. Finally, uh, we will go to the WSO2's implementation of PSD2 EIDAS for UK and Berlin specifications. WSO2 Open Banking is a purpose-built solution to satisfy full technology requirements of PSD2 and Open Banking. So it offers, uh, if I go to the next slide, it offers a lot of key features such as uh, API templates for Open Banking specifications, API analytics, API security with uh, OAuth and EIDAS, which we'll be talking about uh, today and the integration uh, it has several integration points uh, to the core banking backends and uh, strong custom authentication adaptive authentication gdpr compliance fraud detection and most importantly it, uh, it is built on top of uh, wso2 platform so making it uh, easily extensible for digital transformation initiatives beyond open banking So now we will uh, go to the X509 certificates. So this, uh, as I have said, the X509 certificate is the base for the PSD2 EIDAS certificates. So the X509 certificates, uh, they have, they are, they are the digital certificates that have been there for some time now. So this is uh, used widely uh, internationally in uh, the pub public building the public key infrastructure and uh, so it can be used to verify that the certain public key belongs to a user or a computer so uh, this uh, x509 certificates contain a set of informations uh, that will be uh, useful for the uh, receiver of the certificate and as well as the issuer so uh, let me go through one by one and we have a uh, the certificates will have a subject field which contains the uh, name of the user or the uh, service that uses this certificate and uh, it also has a serial number the serial number is provides a unique identifier for each certificate that the ca issues so this can be used to uniquely identify a certificate within a ca it also has a issuer field which contains the distinguished name for uh, the certificate issuer that issues this certificate. And it has a validity period uh, that uh, the time that it will be valid for uh, usage. And then the public key, the, the public key of the asymmetric key pair that is associated with the certificate. So these are the content in an uh, X509 certificate. So what is EIDAS? So EIDAS is the electronic identification, authentication, and trust services. So this is what EIDAS means. So basically, uh, the EIDAS provides a set of trust services that can be used for electronic identification and authentication throughout the European region. So this is something that has been there in the European region uh, since 2016. 
So this came into effect as a regulation in 2016, July 1st. This before PSD2. So this enabled the EI dash technology enabled mutual recognition and acceptance of electronic identifying schemas across the European region. It uh, allowed the businesses to uh, work as seamlessly within the European, throughout the European region. So it also provided the tools necessary for the security and the authentication and the document verification that signing for that is useful for PS2. So because this has uh, this has been not using only for the financial sector but all the other uh, technology sectors. Now with uh, after seeing these advantages that the EIDAS provides, the PSP2 specification adopted this EIDAS infrastructure and that paved the way for PST2 EIDAS certificates. Since now we know what the origin of the PST2 EIDAS is, we can talk about the PST2 EIDAS ecosystem. So it has a national competent authority. So the national competent authority is the competent authority that is responsible for registering the TPPs, the third party providers within the country. This uh, national competent authority, uh, that's the national competent authority for every uh, country in the European region. So they will be responsible for registering the uh, third party providers within their country and uh, maintaining their registration status. So the, the NCA, the National Company Authority will maintain a registry of information containing those uh, TPP authorization information. And uh, it also contains the, uh, the roles that assigned to a particular TPP. So then there's uh, another set of sectors called Qualified Trust Service Providers, QTSPs. Qualified trust service providers are basically certificate authorities, but uh, they have the authority to issue qualified certificates. So the main difference is that the, the qualified status gives a certificate a legal and trust mark, which indicate that it meets the specific technical and security requirements. So this is regulated by the European Union and within uh, each and every uh, country in the European region. Then they have a trust list and the EU list of trust lists. So as I mentioned earlier, the national competent authority, uh, they will maintain the TPPs in their, within their country. And the, there are QTSPs as well in each country. So this national competent authority, the NCA, will publish a list of QTSPs within their country, including their root certificates in a machine passable format. So the benefit of this is uh, it will be a place that a particular third party such as ASPSP can download the root certificates of the QTSPs, Qualified Trust Service Providers. So as you know, uh, in order for us to, if you are familiar with the uh, mutual TLS communication, so in order for us to trust a digital certificate, we need to have its issuer certificate or the issuer's root certificate in our trust store. So this uh, trust list enabled uh, the SPS a way to download those uh, root certificates in a single place. So that's a ASPS is can rely on this uh, trust list to download the required certificates into their trust store. So the each, uh, this trust list are maintained by each and every national in the EU region. So since this is, uh, uh, difficult to maintain multiple lists. The, what the European Union has done is they have aggregated all the lists and created a single list called EU list of trust lists. So now we now the ASPSPs have a single point where they can uh, use to download all the QTSP certificates within the EU region. So they can the, all the ASPSPs can rely on this EU list of trust lists and download the required certificates for their trust store. So let's go to the contents of an PSD2 EIDAS certificate. Now with the understanding of the ecosystem, 
we know that uh, the QTSPs will be the and the NCS will be responsible for issuing uh, will be uh, participated in the issuance of PSD to EIDAS So, uh, and at the beginning of the slide, I told you that uh, the PSD to EIDAS certificates are built on top of the existing X509 certificate. So, uh, what they have done is they have taken the existing X509 certificate and added a separate extension called QC statement, is a qualified statement to the X509 certificate. Why they have done that is uh, they needed to include the PSD to specific information into the certificate. So in order to do that, they have used this QC statement into the certificates. And so that if every PSD to EIDAS certificate will have a QC statement attached to it. So this QC statement will contain a set of uh, PSD to related information. First one is the authorization number. This is a unique number that is issued by the National Competent Authority, the NCA, when they register a TPP. So whenever a TPP goes back to the NCA to register itself, after the registration, the NCA will issue an authorization number to that TPP. So that number will be unique uh, among the, on among that uh, national competent authority, but uh, that's not globally unique because uh, multiple uh, NCS can issue the same uh, authorization number for uh, different TPPs in India region. So because of that, uh, we do we add the prefix. So I'll come back to that in, in my second point. Uh, so we have the, apart from the authorization number, we have a NCA name and ID. So NCA means the National Competent Authority's name and the ID. So this is useful uh, to create that uh, unique prefix. So as I mentioned, uh, the authorization number is not unique across the European region. So uh, in order to create that uh, unique identifier, uh, what they have done is they have appended the NCA ID into the uh, authorization number. So that's uh, making it a uh, unique identify across the European region. And this is uh, called the organizational ID. So in the, in the certificate, this uh, unique ID has been added to the organizational ID field so that uh, the ASPSPs can use that to uniquely identify a TP. And also, and you also know the TPP will have a set of PSD2 roles. So the PSD2 specification defines a set of roles, uh, basically, uh, specifically four types of roles, such as account servicing, payment initiation, account information, and issuing of card-based instruments. So uh, a TPP, a particular TPP can contain any one or multiple of those roles. So the certificate itself also contain these roles that have been assigned to the team. So it will be useful for an ASPSP to identify the set of roles that have been assigned to the TPP as well. So it contains the authorization number the, or the organization ID to uniquely identify the TPP. And it, it also contains the required roles that have been assigned to the team. So both these information will be useful at the ASPSP to have properly identify and authorize the TP. Now let's talk about the registration and the certificate issuance. So as I mentioned, uh, first of all, in order to register, uh, in order for TPP to register itself as a third party provider, uh, it needs to get uh, authorized with the National Competent Authority. So it needs to provide its information and get authorized with this, uh, with the National Competent Authority. So and after authorization, uh, the National Competent Authority will uh, add the TPP's information into its uh, registry. And uh, so after that, the PSPs will uh, get the authorization status as a uh, 
authorized. Then, now uh, the TPP has the authorization status. Now they want to get the EIDA certificate. So what they do is they now go to the qualified trust service provider, QTSP. So once they reach the QTSP, the QTSP will do is uh, it needs to verify this TPP's information. So the the unique place that they can find those information is the NCS registry. So they will the T the QTSPs will go to the NCA registry and uh, verify the TPP's information, its authorization number and its uh, roles assigned to that TPP. So once getting that information, the QTSP now can issue a certificate with those information. So now the T, uh, TPP has uh, got himself a certificate. The, specifically uh, PST to EI dash certificate. Now um, it's usually valid till it's expired. But the certificate can get revoked even before it's expired. So this is called certificate revocation because uh, the certificate authority that issued the certificate, in our case the QTSP, can decide to revoke a certificate by making the certificate invalid. So the, there are several reasons that can cause such a certificate revocation. The main factor is the private key compromise. Let's say, uh, so if you know, uh, in order to create a certificate, we need to create a key pair, a public key and a private key. So the public key we provide to the outside, but the private key is kept safe in our premises. So let's say the private key got compromised so if the private key got compromised, the attacker can use that certificate instead of the actual owner. So this is a very serious condition. So uh, if such thing occurs in the TPP side, if the TPP's uh, private key got compromised, so what the TPP will immediately do is they will uh, tell the QTSP, their certificate issuer, to revoke all its certificates. So it will say that uh, my here my key got uh, Compromise, please revoke all my certificates so that no one other can use those certificates as it's me. So it's uh, one situation where a certificate revocation can occur. And another one is uh, the NCA. Now the NCA will maintain the TPP's authorization status. Right? Let's see. Let's say the NCA now decide to revoke. Uh, NCA now decide to remove the authorization status of. Uh, TPP. So then, uh, if the TPP's authorization has been uh, removed, the its certificate should also get revoked because uh, now the TPP should not be able to use their EIDAS certificate uh, with their ASPSPs. So in such scenario, the NCA will request the uh, QTSP to revoke a particular TPP's certificates. And this can happen for a uh, removal of roles as well. If uh, the roles were removed from a, a TPP, the, then again the set period needs to become invalid. So then again the NCA will request the TPP to uh, revoke the certificates. Then uh, the T so that the T uh, TPP can uh, re-request the new certificates with the new set of roles. So it's clear that uh, whenever we are trusting a certificate, we need to check for its revocation as well. So each time we uh, use a we use a certificate that has been issued by a, a TPP, we need to check whether it's uh, whether it's expired and as well as we need to check whether it's uh, revoked. So for that purpose, there are two standard protocols uh, that have been there for the X509 certificate as well. So those are the online certificate status protocol and certificate revocation list. The online certificate status protocol is the OCSP is a state just service provided by the certificate authority, in our case the QTSP. So what uh, it will do is whenever a certificate got revoked, the the QTSP will update the certificate status to revoke in the OCSP endpoint. 
so that uh, if we want to validate the revocation status, the, we can simply call the OCSP endpoint and check whether the certificate status is revoked or not. So that's simply uh, calling that endpoint and uh, getting uh, checking the response from that OCSP endpoint. And uh, the certificate revocation list, it's a set of lists that have been published by the QTSP uh, where it, uh, this, whenever a QTSP revokes a certificate, it will add the revoke certificates into, the, into a list called certificate revocation list. And it will publish those lists uh, so, so that any third party can view the revokes list. So if we are going to verify our TPP certificate with using revocation list, we need to call the CRL endpoints, the revocation list endpoints, and download all the certificate revocation list. And after downloading the list, we need to go through the list and identify whether the our certificate contains in those lists. So if our certificate can our means the TPP certificate is contains in any of the revocation list, we can uh, identify that the TPP certificate has been revoked. So obviously the CRL check is much slower than the OCSP check. So because of that, uh, we give priority to the OCSP uh, status protocol, uh, the OCSP uh, check when we check for the revocation in our WS2 solution. So uh, if only we got, uh, we didn't get a success response or success or a proper response from the OCSP endpoint, we then go for the CRL uh, check. So this is used as a backup uh, way to check the revocation in the WS2 open banking solution. And uh, both these approaches has a performance in uh, because these these can be costly operations and we need to do this, do this every time we uh, validate a certificate. So because of that, uh, we have a caching mechanism that will cache the status of these uh, revocation protocols and uh, to increase the performance of the request. This diagram so, uh, shows the, the process of the revocation. So as I said, the, the revocation request can come from either the TP, TPP or the National Competent Authority. So uh, in either case, the qualified, uh, the QTSP will uh, validate the request and it will change its OCSP or the CRL endpoints according to the, uh, accordingly. So that uh, not, uh, reliant party such as ASPSP can uh, verify whether the certificate is revoked or not. Types of PSP to EIDA certificates. So uh, the digital certificates can be uh, used for various purposes. So in the PSD2 specification also defines two such types uh, for the PSD2 EIDAS certificates. So first one is the qualified web authentication certificates, QWAC. QWAC certificates are used at the transport layer to secure the communication using TLS protocol. These QX are similar to the SSL certificates that have that we have been using uh, in our SSL connections. So it will uh, be it's the same uh, SS, uh, certificates, but uh, now it has the qualified status. So with those with all those uh, additional QC uh, PSP2 information. So the, basically, what they can do is they can be used at the transport layer to authenticate. Uh, TP. And uh, there's also qualified certificates for seals, Q seals. So uh, Q seal certificates are used for signature validation. So basically, uh, whenever a TPP wants to validate, uh, whenever a TPP wants to send, sign its payload or sign its KWT, they can use their QC certificates. So these QC certificates cannot be used at the transport list, so they are intended to be used at the application list. So even though these, uh, there are two types of uh, 
EIDAS certificates, QAC and QC, uh, they are PhD to information, such as the authorization number and the PhD to roles. Those will be uh, similar as uh, they both of these are issued to a particular TPP. So it's beneficial for the ASPSPs when validating those certificates because um, if you are familiar with the mutual TLS protocol, uh, in order for a TPP to, in order for a client to authenticate using mutual TLS, they need to have the private key in their possession. So we always trust the mutual TLS connection and its certificate that we get from the mutual TLS connection. So QX certificate we can trust obviously because the mutual TLS connection makes sure that no other uh, party can send the any other person certificate through the mutual TLS connection. But it's not the same for the QC certificate because those are not uh, used during the mutual TLS connection. Uh, for an example, in the Berlin specification, the QC certificate is sent as a header. So, uh, so uh, the TPP can send anyone certificate in a header, not not its own set. But uh, in order to valid verify in the ASPSP, and we need to verify that this is actually the TPP certificate. So for that verification, we can use this uh, uh, common uh, PST to information between those two certificates. So as I have said, we can trust the QX certificate because it's come from the mutual TLS connection. Then what we can do is uh, we can uh, check whether the QC certificate contains the same information that was there in the QX certificate. Basically, we can validate the organizational ID of the QX certificate with the QC certificate. Then we know that uh, the both certificate, the QX and the QC law belong to the same TPP who initiated the connection. So now uh, you may have an understanding about the PSD to EIDAS and how those are being used in the uh, financial APIs. Now uh, I'll tell you a bit about the OBI directory support for the PSD to EIDAS. So the OBI directory, it's an uh, OB, op, it's an open banking implementation entity. It's uh, that provides the specification and legislations for the open banking APIs in the UK region. So this OBI directory will be responsible for creating all the uh, APIs and uh, regulates the APIs in the UK region. So they have, uh, they also provide the support for uh, TPPs to uh, register themselves in the OBI directory. So by registering them, the TPPs in the OBI directory, uh, they provide an abstraction layer for the ASPSPs to onboard TPP, TPPs into the ASPSP endpoint. So now, uh, so it's like uh, the OBI act as a middleman that, extra, uh, that provides some set of help for the ASPSPs to uh, register the TPPs into the IN. So this is done by uh, a JWT as I'm called uh, software statements. So the whenever a TPP registered itself into the OBI directory, they will get a software statement that can be later used at the ASPSP endpoint to register. So I will explain that in my later site. And uh, so important part is the the OBI will, uh, the TPPs will first get registered in the OBI directory. So with this registration, uh, the OBI directory will accept the TPPs EIDAS certificates as well. So when whenever TPP register themselves in the OBI directory, they can upload their EIDAS certificates into the OBI directory. And the directory will provide a JWK endpoint exposing those certificates. The advantage there is uh, the now the ASPSPs doesn't have to 
check for the certificates uh, their own because they have now the OBI directory has now provided the JWK endpoint for the ASPSP to validate those certificates. So it will be advantageous. Uh, I'll, uh, so it will be advantageous for the ASPSPs to rely on the JWK endpoint when validating the TPPs. Another advantage is uh, whenever a TPP registered themselves in the OBI directory, the OBI directory will uh, take their EIDAS certificate and uh, they will issue, the OBI directory will issue a certificate, set of certificates called OB certificates. So these are not actual EIDAS certificates, these are EIDAS like certificates. So the main difference is that uh, the EIDA certificates are issued by qualified trust service providers, but uh, the, these uh, OB certificates are issued by the OBI directory, which is not a qualified trust service provider, but provides uh, uh, these directory services. So they will issue a set of certificates called OBVAC and OBC. So this is similar to the QVAC and the QC that we talked earlier. And uh, so now a TPP will have uh, four set of, uh, basically two sets of uh, certificates. One is EIDAS certificates and the other one is OB certificates that have been issued uh, similar to the EIDAS certificate. So the, this can be advantageous for the TPP as well because uh, now, now, now they have registered with the OBI directory, now they want to register with the ASPSP endpoint. So when uh, registering with the ASPSP endpoint, they can either use this, uh, EIDAS certs and or they can use the OB certs. So it's advantageous for the TPP to use the OB certs because they don't have to expose their actual EIDAS cert. So it's a small advantage that they get because the EIDAS certificates are much expensive. So they would, uh, it's uh, normal for them to uh, keep those certificates and uh, they, they can use the OB certificates. And at the same time, they will be, it, if the TPPs will only present the OB certificate, it will be advantageous for the ASPSPs as well. That's because uh, now, uh, as I have said in the beginning that uh, in order for an ASPSPs to trust an EIDA certificate, it needs to have the root certificate of the EIDA, uh, the root certificate of the QTSPs in their trust room. So the ASPSP will have to download the EU trust list and uh, update, uh, maintain its trust to in order for it to accept the EIDA certificates. But what if the TPPs will only provide the OB certificates? So then uh, the, since the OB, all the OB certificates are issued by the OBI directory, the ASPSP doesn't need to maintain a, maintain all the QTSP certificates. That will be done by the OBI direct. So the ASPSP can, what can what it can do is it, it can only uh, add the OB root certificates in which trust to. Because uh, all the OB certificates are issued by the OB uh, root certificate, then the ASPSP need only to have that OB root certificate in their trust to. So it will be easier for the ASPSPs to, uh, to uh, when uh, validating the TPP certificates. So that uh, those, the, all those uh, OB certificate and the EIDA certificate, though, all those certificates will be exposed by the JWK endpoint that is provided by the OBI directory. So that uh, the ASPSPs will have a single point where they can validate the uh, EIDAS or the OB certificates. Now we can go to the PST2 implementation for PST2 EIDAS implementation for the WS2 open banking solution for each uh, the UK and Berlin specification. So the first part is the third party provider in onboarding. The TPP onboarding is the process of registering a third party provider in the ASPSP side. So currently there are three methods that the W store open banking solution supports for this TPP onboarding. 
they are dynamic client registration, manual client registration, and sign up workflow. This uh, dynamic client registration and manual client registration both are uh, OBIE directory integrated uh, onboarding methods. So that the as I, uh, the in order to use these methods, the TPP will first needs to be onboarded with the OBI directory. The sign up flow is a separate one that can be used for by the uh, ASPSPs which are not using the OBI directory. So uh, the OWS to open banking store can be configured to use uh, one of these uh, methods by an ASPSP. So um, both these, uh, both the manual client registration and the sign up workflow are manual approaches, and uh, they don't. Uh, the EI dash certificates don't, uh, doesn't come into place when the during the registration process. But uh, the dynamic client registration (DCR) is a uh, it's a process where uh, the TPP will use its uh, EI dash certificate during the registration. So because of that reason, uh, we'll talk more about this dynamic client registration and how it's uh, validate the TPP EI dash certificates in our next slide. So the dynamic client registration is the, uh, it allows the third party providers to register in the ASPSP endpoint dynamically. So during the during DCR, the TPP sends the registration request, including a software statement assertion in the claim payroll. So the software statement assertion is a, a JWD that contains all the application information for so that the ASPSP can easily create the application in the ASPSP side. So this uh, software statement assertion is issued by the OBI directly. Since now the uh, in order to use DCR, the TPP needs to be uh, registered in the OBI directory. So when they register in the OBI directory, they will get a uh, software statement and they can create their software statement assertion from that. And this assertion can be uh, then be uh, sent along in the DCR request. So this uh, assertion, so the SSA is signed by uh, the OBI directory and uh, the SPSP can verify, validate the signature when they use this uh, SSA. So this is the DCR flow, basic flow that uh, occurs in the between the TPP and the SPSP. So this uh, DCR and the DCR endpoint at the SPSP is uh, protected using mutual DNS. So in order for in order for TPP to call this endpoint, they need to uh, initiate a mutual TLS connection. So as I mentioned, now uh, they have they will have to use the uh, EI dash or the the EI dash OB back, the transfer certificate or the uh, QVAC. So now since they have registered with the OBI directly, they will get a uh, OBVAC as well. So they can either use their OBVAC or the QVAC uh, when they register to initiate the mutual TLS connection. Then uh, they will send the registration request with the SSA. And uh, this SSA will contain the JWK endpoint that is maintained by the OBI directory. So uh, what the ASPSP can do is, uh, so, uh, now the TPP has initiated the request using it, its mutual TLS uh, certificate. So the, the, the ASPSP, can use this JW case to valid, verify whether the mutual data certificate, the QVAC certificate, or the OBVAC certificate that is presented by the uh, TPP is uh, they are in the JW case endpoint. So otherwise, it can uh, reject the request. So if this is successful, uh, the TPP, the SPSP will create the TPP application in the SPSP side. Now the registration has been done, and uh, now the next request by the TPP would be to uh, generate the access tokens required to call the PSP to APS.
so the token generation this is uh, so in the ws open bank is solution there are currently uh, two approaches the two ways for authenticating to the token endpoint so these two are public compliant and they are the private key jwt and the tls client token. so in the private key jwt approach uh, the tpp will send the, again the jwt assertion that is signed using the tpp's uh, qc certificate so then the aspsp can uh, at the ASPS, uh, the, the WSP Open Bank solution can uh, get this uh, JWT from the request and it can validate the signature of the JWT. So for that, uh, it can use two methods. Uh, either it can check for the, as I mentioned, if the, if the TPP has been, uh, OBI has been registered in the OBI directory, they will get a JWK input. So the, now the, where in order to validate this uh, the JWT during the token generation, so it, uh, the deep, the SPSP need to get the QC certificate of the TPP. For that, uh, the SPSP can either use the JWK endpoint that has been shown by the uh, OBI directory, or if this is if this TPP has not been registered with the OBI directory, let's say. Now our solution does not support OBI directory. Then uh, at the registration itself, we allow the TPP to uh, upload their QC certificate into our store. Then uh, at the token generation, what the SPSP can do is it can validate the JWT assertion signature using that certificate stored in the application. So the SPSP can either use the uh, JWK endpoint, or the uh, if it is not OBI integrated, it can use the uh, QC certificate that have been stored in the application. The next approach is the TLS client token. So this is basically use, uh, using uh, mutual TLS to authenticate to the token endpoint. So for that, uh, the TPP can use the QX certificate, it's uh, transport certificate, or the OBX certificate to initiate the mutual TLS connection. Then again, uh, what the ASPSP will do is it will, after passing the mutual TLS connection, uh, it will take the QX certificate and verify whether the QX certificate is actually belong to that uh, TPP. This verification can be done by either uh, using the JWK endpoint that got, uh, that have been uh, added to the, during the registration and, or as I have mentioned, it can use the Q seal certificate itself. Uh, the during the registration, the uh, when we when we when the user uploads the Q seal certificate, it can uh, so we can store the organizational ID of the Q seal certificate. So I have told you that this organizational ID will be unique for the particular TPP, even in their Q seal certificate or in their OB uh, uh, QX certificate. So what we can do is. Uh, now we have the organization ID of the TPP that got registered. So during token generation, what we can do is we can take the QX certificate and uh, validate the QX certificate using, uh, validate the organization ID present in the QX certificate using the organization ID associated with the application. So if it is success, we can uh, pass the, uh, we can authenticate the so these are token generation flows that I have talked to you about. So we have the uh, TLS client auth where the uh, ASPSP will uh, use its uh, QX or the OBVAC certificate uh, to authenticate and uh, it will uh, using the token request and the ASPSP will extract the OBVAC or the QX certificate from the mutual session and it validates the organization ID associated with the application with the organization ID present in the QX certificate. And uh, in the private key JWT method, it, uh, the, the ASPSP will uh, get the token request, the JWT from the token request, and uh, it will either uh, verify the signature using the QC certificate stored in the JWK, so the QC certificate stored in the 
uh, application. And uh, it, if it is success, it will send the success token response. So now uh, the now the TPP has generated an access token as well. So the next step would be to invoke the APIs. So during the API invocation as well, we we can do uh, EI dash validation. So basically, there are two types of validation that we can do during the API invocation. First one is the organizational ID validation. So as, as I uh, explained to you, the organizational ID is the unique identifier for TP. So during the API invocation, the uh, ASPSP can get the uh, so in order for uh, these validations to be work, uh, the APIs, the PSD to APIs need to be uh, mutually authenticated. Uh, the the PSD to APIs should be protected using mutual TLS. So if it is pro protected using mutual TLS, the uh, the TP will have to use its uh, QVAC or the OBVAC certificate uh, during API invocation. So then. Uh, the TP, the ASPSP can validate the organization ID present in the uh, QVAX or the OBVAX certificate with either the JWKS endpoint or uh, with the organization ID that is associated with the application. Then uh, another check that we can do is the PSD to role validation. So you know that uh, the TPP will have the PSD to roles as well assigned to it. And these roles, roles will be present in the EI dash, the PSD to EI dash certificate as well. So during API invocation, we can validate whether the particular API that is being invoked matches with the role that is there in the TPP certificate. We can do this using the scopes associated with the token. So let's say it's for the, the TPP is calling the payments API in the UK specification. So it needs to have the payment scope. So if the token contains the payment scope, we can check whether the particular uh, EI DAS certificate, the QVAC or the QC, also contain the role that is uh, matched with the scopes, the payments uh, scope. So if it is there, we can allow the request. Otherwise, if the scope, uh, the if the role, there are no roles matching with the provider scopes, we can reject the request. So from that point, uh, we can uh, end the webinar from now. And uh, yeah, one thing we uh, so this is the API invocation flow that I have uh, talked about earlier so it will uh, as the tpp will uh, initiate the api invocation using mutual, mutual tls and uh, the spsp can uh, get the mutual tls set with the qvac or the qc and check for the org id and uh, at the same time it can uh, validate for the phd2 roles of the set as well Then uh, only if those two validations were success, it can uh, send the API. It, it can allow the TPP to access the API. So from that, uh, we will uh, end this webinar. So if you have uh, questions here, let me uh, check. Yeah, uh, so there's the one question saying that, uh, the NCS are the central banks, so it's not uh, it's not uh, the banks actually. So the these are the government authorities that have been uh, that have been there in each EU country. So uh, there's not much explanation about the NCS in the uh, HC specification, but in the PSP to uh, the EI DAS specification, it's defined as the authorization body that's uh, that will be used to uh, give access to the TPPs in each country. 
so there they will be the central body that uh, in each country that the tpps can get registered whether api invocation validation with the uh, obvac or qvac need to be handled as the aspsp or is it as a part of the open banking solution so uh, in this in my slides uh, what i have uh, mentioned as aspsp is the actually the open banking solution so the the validations that i have mentioned all are done by the open banking solution itself so uh, the bank doesn't need to care doesn't need to care on those validations all those uh, required eidas validations will be performed by the wc to open banking solution so for answer your question the api invocation validations will also be handled by the uh, wc to open banking solution so only after those uh, uh, validations are success they will pass the request back to the bank the actual aspsp So uh, sorry for if there's a, if there's been a misunderstanding within the ASPSP name and the WS Open Banking solution. So uh, since both are deployed in the same place, I have used the ASPSP word in my slides, but it's the, actually the WS Open Banking solution. Uh, there's an, okay another question asking whether the QTSP will issue both QVAC and QSEAL certificates, or if the TPP requests for both. So it's up to the TPP actually, because uh, both the QVAC and the QSEAL will uh, cost separately. So if you go for a QVAC, uh, you will have to purchase separately a QSEAL. Uh, we have to purchase the QSEAL separately. So those are two certificates that have that will be issued separately. Uh, and uh, it's not uh, currently it's not mandated for TPP to have both these certificates. Uh, they can. Uh, uh, what they what the EBA has to tell is uh, they can use the QVAC or the QSEAL or the OBO. So it's not uh, mandated for a QTSP to have uh, both of these EI certificates. They can use a, a default, a, a normal X5 certificate for uh, for the other purpose. So either for the QVAC or the, they can replace the QVAC or the QC using uh, another uh, general X509 certificate. So, but at least one of these certificates should be uh, PSD2 EIDAS. So, what have, uh, there's another question in that what happens if the scope is slightly different from the approved roles? So, uh, this is, I think uh, you are checking, uh, you are having, uh, you are basically wondering whether the scope can be, uh, there can be different scopes that will be assigned to the, uh, that will contain in the access token. So uh, in our solution, we have assigned specific scopes for uh, specific APIs. So what we will validate only those scopes. So we know that the, the names of those scopes will be same in every case. So we don't look at the other uh, scopes that are there in the uh, access token. We only check for the specific uh, API specific scopes. So these are uh, set by the OBI solution itself. So we know that uh, there's a one-to-one -one match with the scope and the role. So there, uh, so because of that, there's no confusion in our end when validating. So if if well, if the the if the API scopes are there, we they are need, need to have the uh, specific role as well. Uh, there's another question saying that whether the QTSP role is mandatory in urban banking as the OBI itself share in the OBVAC and OBC. Yeah, this may come as a question because uh, the OBI directory is acting as the QTSP, uh, providing the OBVAC and OBCs. But, uh, the FCAS, uh, so OBI directory is not a QTSP. So the EI, the PSD2 EI specification mandates only a QTSP can issue the EI certificates. So what the OBI directory is issuing are EI like certificates. So it's not sufficient for TPP to get just the OBVAC and OB certificate. It needs to have the actual EI certificates. Otherwise, uh, it won't be useful. Uh, it, it, they won't. Uh, uh, they won't adhere with the specification. So they need to get the actual EIDA certificates 
from a proper QTSP, not the OBI directory, from a proper QTSP. But uh, what the OBI directory will do is they will uh, provide the support to, for abstracting those certificates and providing OB certificates on top of these EID certificates. But the, these OBVEC and OB seals are not EID certificates. They are EID light certificates, which are just an abstraction. So answering to your question directly, the Q, yes, the QTSP role is mandatory in urban banking. Uh, so the another question is uh, multi-factor authentication will be handled at what point of time, whether before token generation or how WS2 handles the identity of the end customer who uses the TP. So currently, uh, the we only validate the application, not the end customer. So uh, what the process, the flow will be is uh, first the TPP or the application will uh, generate the access token. So it will send the access token request. So uh, during that request, we will validate the TPP, whether its certificate is uh, correct or not. So after that, uh, after that, the request passed to the uh, end user to multi-factor authentication or basic authentication or any other authentication step. So uh, we don't validate the user, actual user. So the, the EIDAS validation only happen at the application side. So, uh, so the uh, WS2 handles the end customer who uses the TP is using the same multi-factor authentication uh, factors that have been there from the beginning. So there is no EIDAS validation there. So only the EIDAS, EIDAS validation will be there for the TPP application and the SPSP, the WS2 Open Banking Solution, not be, between the uh, end user and the WS2 Open Banking Solution. So I hope uh, those are all the questions that they have. If you have any uh, other questions that come later, you can uh, contact us uh, through our WS2 contacts. Uh, I think. Uh, we can share the, our contact details in the chat or so that uh, you can uh, contact us later if you have any further questions regarding this or you would you like to know or know much about our solution. Uh, so from that, uh, let's uh, we will end the webinar now. Thank you for joining.